Hey guys, it's Kira, and today I'm here with my Hedwig mug of tea and I thought it'd be really fun to try and recommend some books based on all of the different Hogwarts houses. So as you might be able to tell from my green jumper, I'm gonna be starting with my house, which is Slytherin. I'm honestly super excited just because I've tried to pick books that maybe weren't like super obviously Slytherin or Gryffindor and I've tried to kind of go like a little bit more in depth into like the qualities of the houses and like the various ways that different books could apply to them. So I really had a fun time picking all of the books. So without further ado, I'll let you know which books I've picked for Slytherin and all of the other houses as well. So the first book I've picked out for Slytherin is probably one of the more obvious recommendations in this video, and that is A Game of Thrones by George R. R. Martin. And the main reason I picked out this book is because of the theme of power, which is of course very important to this entire book series, but it's also one of the key traits of Slytherin. And reading Game of Thrones as well as watching the series has definitely made me feel like a lot of the characters could definitely fit into the Slytherin house just because of the way that the book series sort of unfolds and the way that lots of the characters end up behaving. So obviously this is a book series that centers around sort of political intrigue and the main theme, which this very complicated book series focuses on, is the constant plight for power and the way that power is not just something that is earned and then kept but is a constant struggle and in this series we have many characters trying to sort of make their claim for ultimate power which in this series is of course getting to take a seat on the Iron Throne and be the king or queen of the entire seven kingdoms of Westeros and so there is a constant plight for power and it is not a sort of linear journey it's very complicated and for that reason we see a lot of the characters then have Having to be very crafty with how they make their claims and we see a lot of cunning behaviour, resourcefulness and quite honestly people act in quite a self-centred way because they're so focused on their individual journey for power and self-preservation they don't necessarily have time or resources to focus on what other people might need or want and it's very much about sort of putting yourself first and making your journey to get ultimate power and I just feel like because of that and the way that the series unfolds we see so many characters who maybe at the beginning of the series maybe had what you might perceive as more honour sort of descend into an, an like a frenzy of determination to get power and I just think it's really interesting to see how all of these characters are moulded by their journey towards becoming leaders and whether or not that's a positive thing I don't know but I do know that they definitely act in a way that could be considered very very Slytherin like and I feel like a lot of the characters in this book are super Slytherin and just the theme in general Game of Thrones is so complicated we have so many characters and so many storylines going on but I feel like one thing that is central to the entire series is that sort of journey towards power which makes it a perfect book for if you're interested in reading about some Slytherin like themes. Now on a slightly different note, the next book I've picked up is We Have Always Lived in the Castle by Shirley Jackson. Now this is a short horror style novel, although personally when I read it, I didn't necessarily find it to be like a classic horror. It was a little bit more of a like, thriller mystery type novel but nevertheless it is certainly a book that focuses on some darker themes which in and of itself makes it sort of a little bit more towards the Slytherin side of what the Hogwarts house is. However there are a few other reasons why I feel like this would be a good book for Slytherins as well. Now within this book, which is to say the least quite a bizarre reading experience, we follow three members of a family, um, two sisters, Mary Cat and Constance, and also their uncle Julian. And these family members are quite strange because they just behave in very, very unusual ways. However, what makes this book very relevant to the Slytherin house, in my opinion, is that these three family members are surrounded by a big scandal because everyone else in their family was killed several years ago in what was assumed to be a murder by one of the three remaining members of the family. However, it is an unsolved murder. And although no one has officially been convicted, they have then been kind of like pushed aside and shunned by the rest of the members of their community. They live on the outskirts of town in quite a large house and are therefore just kind of left to their own devices, but people don't really want to interact with them and sort of assume the worst of them all of the time. And of course, this is a book which is filled with lots of mystery and intrigue. And because of the fact that the characters are very unusual, you don't necessarily know whether or not you're supposed to trust them. However, what I do think is interesting and makes it connect to the Slytherin household is that 
People tend to view Slytherins in a negative light and assume things about them based on stories that they've heard or other members of the Slytherin house. And I feel like it's interesting that in this book, these three members of the family have not been convicted of a murder, but yet they are treated as though they are convicted by other members of the community and people in that community therefore like make their assumptions about them. So I won't give any spoilers about whether or not we do find out who committed the murders. However, I just think it's interesting that people make these un founded assumptions and treat these people differently and make assumptions about their character based on the fact that they are just part of a particular family and I feel like that's definitely true of how certain people can tend to treat Slytherins within the Harry Potter books because people make assumptions about them based on other members of that house which I think is really interesting so yeah this is a really cool book it's very bizarre a little bit of a strange reading experience but I personally really enjoyed it it's dark and intriguing and I loved it and then moving on to the final book that I've picked as a Slytherin recommendation, and that is Normal People by Sally Rooney, which I absolutely love. Unfortunately, I don't have a physical copy here because I only read the book by borrowing my friend's copy, but I will be rectifying that very soon and buying my own version because I love the book so much. But for now, you will just have to make do with a picture of the cover here on the screen. But moving on to why I think this is a really good book for people wanting to learn more about the sort of experience of being a Slytherin, or just like read a little bit about the traits that make up the Slytherin house. I feel like this book is one that focuses on the complexities of relationship and there are a few factors in particular which I think really connect to some of the experiences of Slytherin wizards that we see in the Harry Potter books. Predominantly this book focuses on the relationship between our two main characters Marianne and Connell who sort of have a long-term relationship which goes between friendship and romance right throughout the book and it's a very very complex relationship but it starts when they're 18 and just leaving high school and Marianne and Connell come from very very different backgrounds in the sense that Marianne is from a very wealthy economic background however socially she doesn't really fit in in school and is kind of a bit of an outcast within the school community. Connell on the other hand is from a much less wealthy background and his mum is actually the cleaner for Marianne's family however he's extremely popular in school and has a much better social standing than Marianne does. Now they obviously had this connection outside of school due to the fact that his mum worked for Marianne's family and therefore they start to build a relationship and a connection outside of the confines of the school community. However we see Connell dealing with the fact that he's kind of too embarrassed to reveal this relationship to anyone else within the school community for fear of how that will reflect on his social standing. Now for me I feel like this is just so connected to the experience that we see within the Harry Potter books of the Slytherin status of being very focused on being pure blood and then the sort of way that certain Slytherin people treat people who are half blood and then even worse how they treat people who are muggle-borns and the fear of interaction between other wizards who don't fit into that pure blood status and how that will like sort of reflect on them as a pure blood wizard and how that will affect their status as a pure blood and Slytherin wizard and I feel like it's really interesting to see how their interactions are affected Affected by how they fear it will affect their social standing. What I find interesting about this book is how Connell sort of has to experience the tables being turned in order to sort of reflect on his treatment of Marianne and how he sort of behaved about her based on her social status and I feel like it's really interesting that this book follows them for quite a few years right up until they're about to leave university so we see so many variations of their relationship and the complexities of how they treat one another affecting their relationship and there are various times where each of them are either better off socially or worse off socially and that kind of affects the way that they treat one another and I think it's just really interesting because it kind of reflects the experience that we see certain Slytherin characters have within the Harry Potter books, particularly people like Draco who have been born into pure blood families and have been taught a certain sort of moral sort of guide of how they should behave and then as the books go on we see them having to sort of wrestle with their own morality and figure out how it is that they want to treat people and question the morals that they've been taught by people above them. And I just think this book really plays into that and sort of falls into how different social statuses can affect how we treat one another and how it reflects individually on us as people. So I feel like although this is a very much a contemporary book which doesn't have any sort of magical elements, the theme of complexities of relationships is really, really key to some of the things that we see Slytherin wizards going through in Harry Potter. So now we're in blue and it's time to do some Ravenclaw recommendations. 
Now, of course, wit and intelligence are two things that are key to Ravenclaw, but also creativity. So I feel like I've picked a book which fits into kind of like all of the Ravenclaw traits to begin with, and that is Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. I feel like the amazing thing about this book is that we of course focus on four sisters, Meg, Jo, Amy and Beth, and because of that we see four very different personalities who each have their own like key traits, but I do feel like each of the four sisters could fit into Ravenclaw House, just because they all have like a big focus on having their own particular talent and really honing that talent and being as successful as possible, and so we see each of the sisters kind of really like focusing on their particular area of expertise and really becoming excellent at it. So obviously one of the main focuses is Jo, who is of course a writer, but we also have Beth who's into music. I think that um, Meg is also quite into singing and then we have Amy who is drawing. And so we have these four very talented and creative sisters who are each kind of focused on becoming successful in their individual rights. So of course this book was set in the 1800s and for that reason as well as showing us this journey of these young girls into talented young women, we also see an exploration of how women were valued in society at that time and what society saw as valuable qualities within women and I feel like Louisa May Alcott did a really good job of like challenging those expectations and challenging the things that women were seen to be good for because of course at that time women were seen predominantly to be homemakers and the values of being a good wife and a good mother were the most important things and although this book definitely does explore those elements of life and shows how there could be value found within having a happy home it also really challenges the fact that that is all women can do which I think was really really interesting and definitely fits into the Ravenclaw qualities because particularly in our characters of Amy and Jo who really sort of chase after their dreams and do things which go against the norm and kind of like challenge expectations and sometimes go against the advices of their families we see these characters becoming very strong very determined and becoming happy in the fact that they're chasing their own particular dreams and I feel like by the end of this this book we have this sort of value in our minds of the fact that although you can find value with sort of doing things within the home and having a happy home life there is also extreme value to be found in recognizing your own particular talents and pursuing them no matter what anyone else says which I feel like is so Ravenclaw it's not that everyone has to be intelligent in terms of being very academic but I feel like in this book we see people recognizing their particular creativity or their personal intelligence and pursuing that no matter what, which I think is so Ravenclaw and I absolutely loved it. So my next Ravenclaw pick is Eleanor Oliphant is Completely Fine by Gail Honeyman, which is a book which focuses definitely on learning, but of learning of a very different kind to the academic learning that I guess we typically expect from Ravenclaws. But I feel like nonetheless, the learning is such a key part of this book, which I feel like makes it a perfect read for Ravenclaws. Now, of course, in this book, we follow a woman called Eleanor Oliphant, who, as the title would let us believe, starts the book thinking that she's completely fine. But as the book goes on, we start to gather that that might not exactly be the case because Eleanor is a very, very lonely woman. She's in her mid thirties, I believe, and she kind of lives a very mundane life. She's quite an eccentric character, very set in her ways, but she really just goes out to work, comes home, drinks a lot and repeats. And that is kind of all she has going for her in life. She's doesn't really have any social life to speak of, any family or anything like that. So she's living a very lonely and very repetitive lifestyle. And I guess as a sort of defense mechanism, she's kind of let herself believe that that is completely fine because it is a very simple routine to follow. And therefore you can sort of feel like you're just plodding along and there's nothing wrong with what you're doing. But as this book starts to unfold, we see Eleanor start to crave more from life and start to wish that she had something else other than this mundane routine going for her. Now, as someone who has lived a solitary life for a long time, this is a huge learning experience for Eleanor and we see her have to learn to interact with people in what would be considered like a normal way as well as how to accept friendship and kindness from other people because in a sort of solitary lifestyle she'd become so sort of boxed in and she'd put up her walls so high that she really didn't know how to be someone's friend, but also how to accept friendship from anyone. And so it's a really, really interesting experience and I feel like it really focuses on these sort of 
social and emotional side of learning but I think it's such an interesting book it can be quite dark in places because it does deal with some very sort of emotional topics and um, from sort of like focusing on past trauma and things like that however I do think it's a really really valuable book and I personally really loved reading it I can't wait to reread it actually I'm hoping to pick it up again quite soon because it was such a brilliant reading experience but if you are sort of wanting to read a book which focuses on learning in kind of a more abstract and social way I think this is a brilliant picture because it really does focus on having to transform yourself as a person and how you can learn sort of on your journey through life and how learning isn't always something that can be done from books. It was a really, really valuable read for me and I thought it was just such a good one. And then moving on to our final Ravenclaw pick, we have Strange the Dreamer by Lani Taylor. So probably my most obvious Ravenclaw pick because Strange the Dreamer is a book which focuses on our main character, Laszlo Strange, who at the beginning of the book is working in a library in like a huge citadel. And so of course it starts in a place which is kind of like a Ravenclaw's dream because who doesn't love like the idea of libraries, especially if you are a Ravenclaw who loves reading and learning and all things educational. So it starts off in an environment which I think is just perfect for any Ravenclaw but then as the book develops I feel like again it delves into learning and intelligence in a variety of different ways. So as we start the book, Laszlo, our main character, is working in the library and he is kind of obsessed with this ancient lost city called Weep and he is trying to find out every single thing he can about it and one day he'd love to sort of try and find it and figure out more about it and just experience this world which he's become so obsessed with. And that dream kind of becomes a reality because a group of people from this lost city of Weep turn up to the place where Laszlo is living on a journey to try and get some great people from the town to try and help them on a plight to get rid of something that is plaguing their city. Now, of course, these people from Weep who've come to try and find people to help them save their city are looking for people who are of high social standing, who'll bring value and intelligence and bravery to their journey. And so Laszlo doesn't really think he has much chance, but because of his knowledge and kind of obsession with Weep and his knowledge of everything that happened there and their language, he manages to make himself seem like an attractive member of the team. And so they bring him along and he actually gets to live out his sort of like wildest dreams by seeing this place that he'd only ever read about. But of course, as someone who was an orphan and then just a lower level library worker in this huge town, Laszlo never really placed much value in himself or his intelligence and just didn't really feel like he had much worth and so as Laszlo is on his journey towards Weep, this place of his wildest dreams, he has to really go on his own journey of trying to sort of recognise what value he can bring to this quest and sort of recognise his own intelligence and his own worth and we have other characters who potentially saw themselves as more worthy going on kind of like a reverse journey where they start to question what value they can bring and whether or not they are as good as they had always believed they were. So it's a really interesting journey where people are obviously on a particular mission to try and save this lost city and yet people are also on their own individual emotional journeys as well so there's a lot of learning a lot of creativity required to try and save this city and it's just a really interesting book which I loved it's part of a duology so it's followed by Muse of Nightmares which is just as good and has the same themes of trying to save this city and everything that comes along with it and all the characters that make up the city and there are a lot of other elements in it as well which I don't really want to give away because it is such a complicated but really interesting story and I just think it's so good. It's also very very well written, the book has such a lyrical and mystical style which I think is just really fitting for like anyone who just loves reading books. I just think this is such a good book and I honestly loved it. I think it's perfect for Ravenclaws and for anyone but you know it's definitely got some Ravenclaw themes in there as well. Next up we're moving on to our Hufflepuff recommendations and the first book I've got to recommend is Watership Down by Richard Adams. Now I don't know if this is an official Hufflepuff Hufflepuff trait or if it's just a trait that a lot of the Hufflepuffs I know tend to embody but I feel like Hufflepuffs tend to be animal lovers and of course this is a book which focuses solely on the world of animals and in particular on the world of rabbits. It's also a book that just has a very like cozy wholesome heartwarming vibes and again a lot of the Hufflepuffs I know and sort of 
particularly ones I watch on YouTube, tend to really focus on those cozy vibes all the time. So again, I feel like it's a really good book in terms of that. But there are also a few other factors which I think make it a really great Hufflepuff read as well. Now Hufflepuffs tend to focus on loyalty and this is a book which focuses on a group of rabbits which leave their home warren because one of them has a feeling that something bad is going to happen and so they decide to go out on their own journey to try and find a new safe space to get there. Now lots of rabbits stay behind but a group of them decide to head out and I feel like in that sense of these rabbits banding behind this one small rabbit who has a feeling that something bad is going to happen and choosing to trust him really fits into that sense of loyalty because they don't really have any reason to believe him other than the fact that they trust him as a rabbit and so they follow along with this tiny rabbit called Fiverr and trust in what he and his brother Hazel say and therefore these rabbits kind of all come together and they have this immediate sense of loyalty which I feel like continues right throughout the entire book. And so as well as that initial sense of loyalty I feel like we also see these rabbits who are all quite young going on this very premature journey in which they have to kind of like figure out how they're going to go about life and who will lead them and therefore they have to kind of like sort of leave behind the structures of leadership and just the general structures of life behind that they left at the home warren and sort of forge their own way they have to choose a leader and rally behind them and trust in what their leader says it's just a really interesting book which requires a lot of blind loyalty and i just absolutely love it and then another thing that is kind of key to the hufflepuff house is justice and just kind of doing the right thing and i feel like that definitely fits into this book as well particularly as a reader you really are focused on justice because you become so attached attached to these rabbits as characters and you become so invested in their journey and their aims and hopes and dreams and you really just hope that justice will pull through and the rabbits will achieve what they've set out to do and that they'll all be safe and get to where they're hoping to go and all of that and you're just really hoping that justice will come through and achieve that for you and for the characters because it is such a nerve-wracking intense story because you're following a group of very vulnerable prey animals and you don't know what's going to happen. It's a very very tense book but I absolutely love it and it's one that compels you right throughout because you've got this sort of like you personally develop a sense of loyalty for the characters and you hope that everything's going to be okay so I feel like it's a really great book in terms of exploring loyalty and family and friendship and all of those fun things and I just think it's such a wholesome book. Now following some very similar themes but with definitely a much less cosy and wholesome vibe and sort of exploring a much darker side of these themes, I also think that the book A Little Life by Hanya Yanagihara is a great read if you're interested in exploring the themes of loyalty and justice. Now I very recently did a 24 hour readathon where I read this book in one day which was let me tell you an emotional experience to say the least but I will pop a link to that in the description below if you want to watch it because it was a really really great read I loved it so much and obviously had a lot of thoughts because it's quite a chunky book I'll also put a list of all of the trigger warnings to be wary of when going into this book because it is a book as I said which deals with some very dark topics but moving on to why I think this is a great book for some of the themes that make up the bulk of the Hufflepuff house. Loyalty is one of the key things this book explores and I feel like it's integral to the entire story. Because in this book, we start off following a group of four friends, Jude, Willem, Malcolm and JB, as they're kind of in their 20s, making their way in New York. They're a group of friends who met in college and have been kind of like friends ever since. And we follow them from this point in their 20s, right up until like, I think they're in their 50s at the end of the book. So we follow them over a considerable considerable period of their lives and see all of the sort of peaks and troughs of their friendship and how it develops but how loyalty is kind of key to everything that goes on in their lives. Now despite following a group of four friends the key friend who this book follows is Jude and this book really focuses on his story right throughout the book. Now we know right from the beginning of the book there is a sort of a mystery and a darkness surrounding Jude's past because his friends really don't know too much about what happened to him before they met at college. However we gradually start to learn more about a lot of the trauma that Jude experienced right throughout his life and throughout his childhood and we really delve into how that trauma has impacted Jude's life in adulthood and how it affects how he interacts with his friends, how he goes about relationships and how he views himself as a person. 
Now obviously because this book follows a story which delves quite deeply into the theme of trauma, we see Jude as a character who really doesn't necessarily value himself as a person. However, where this becomes really interesting and connected to the Hufflepuff sort of themes is the fact that his friends all see value and sort of amazing things within him as a character that he doesn't necessarily recognize within himself and because of that he's so grateful for their sense of loyalty and he is kind of really devastatingly grateful when people do nice things for him because he doesn't necessarily view himself as worthy of it and I think it's a really really emotional story because you see loyalty as so key to Jude as a character because this loyalty is kind of like what pulls him through so many dark times but you also see the sort of devastating reality of how necessary it is to him so it's a really really difficult book but I think friendship, loyalty, found family and finding people who can be there for you when blood family doesn't necessarily follow through in that sense is really interesting however this book does also focus a little bit on justice. For one thing, Jude is a lawyer, but in another way, um, unfortunately, it focuses on the way that justice doesn't necessarily always happen. And by looking into the theme of trauma and how trauma can have such sort of long lasting effects even many, many decades after an original event has happened, we see how justice has many forms and a lack of justice also has many forms in the sense that despite sometimes justice occurring in a legal system, we also have characters who will never have justice because of the things that have been taken away from them by trauma that they've suffered. So it is a dark book and not necessarily the cosy vibes that you might typically expect from a Hufflepuff recommendation. However, I do think the strength of loyalty with in this book and that depth of the exploration of that theme just makes it such a key book for exploring a theme which is so integral to the Hufflepuff house so of course go into it with caution and read the trigger warnings if you think it's something that might be difficult for you but if you think that you can read this book and it won't affect you negatively except for just making you emotional like it did for me I would highly recommend it because it is such an incredible book it delves into characters in such great depth and honestly I just cannot get over this book and then my final Hufflepuff recommendation would have to be The Storied Life of AJ Fickrey by Gabrielle Devon. Now with this read, I feel like it's more the overall vibe and feeling that you get from the story that makes it a great Hufflepuff book rather than necessarily any specific themes. But in this book, we follow a guy called AJ Fickrey who has recently lost his wife. Now AJ is the bookshop owner on a small island, so he's part of a very small, like contained community. But AJ, since losing his wife, has been becoming an increasingly sort of grumpy, isolated, self-contained character who doesn't really have any interest in interacting with the outside world. However, that kind of changes when one day a baby is left in his bookshop and despite originally wanting to sort of get in touch with social services and kind of, you know, get rid of the problem that has been put on his doorstep, AJ finds this baby as a unique opportunity to change his life and this baby becomes a source of light and motivation and a reason to transform himself back into a much happier individual. Now of course there are many other things that happen within this book and it is a really interesting story but I think what's really interesting is that you have these two disconnected souls who are both kind of like abandoned. AJ has been widowed whereas this baby has just been left by its mother and they manage to find each other and be the sort of rock that each other needs which I just think is really interesting and of course this book delves into kindness and the way that communities can rally together and how AJ can find sort of a sense of belonging within his community when people sort of get behind him to try and help him raise this new child and I feel like kindness, loyalty, doing the right thing in trying to raise this baby and give it a good home just make it a really great Hufflepuff book but it is a really heartwarming story and just such a lovely and uplifting read which I just think screams Hufflepuff. So we've made it on to the final house and of course we're moving on to Gryffindor recommendations. So the first book I've picked out for Gryffindor is The Immortalists by Chloe Benjamin. So this book was actually recommended to me by M because we did like a collaboration where we picked a TBR for each other and this was one of the books that M recommended for me and honestly I loved this book so much. It was definitely my favourite of the books that she recommended me and I was 
so happy to have read it because it really wasn't that high up my priority list before that so I was super excited to read it and I'll pop a link down below to the reading vlog for this book that I did because I loved it so much but moving on to why I think this is a really good Gryffindor recommendation. This book follows four siblings over a significant period of time. It starts in the like late 60s and it goes right up until the mid noughties so it follows a significant period of these siblings lives but it starts when they're all quite young I believe they're ranging from age 6 to 13 at the beginning of the book and these siblings are kind of bored on a hot summer day in New York City so they decide to go see a psychic who tells them all the day that they're going to die and that's kind of like the prologue to the book and then the book follows each of the siblings in their own section basically seeing how this prophecy has affected the way that they choose to live. Now of course in terms of Harry Potter when we think about getting all the way to the Deathly Hallows this becomes a very very connected story to Harry's own journey because the theme of like kind of knowing when you're going to die and taking responsibility for your own life is very very key in Harry's own journey but putting that to one side I also just think the way that the siblings behave within this book makes them well some of them very Gryffindor. Now whether you believe in prophecy or not I think we could probably all agree that for children going to find out the day that you're going to die is quite a brave thing to do because for children being told you will die on this day in this year is quite a terrifying sort of revelation and could seem very real to a lot of children. And so despite the fact that when we go through this book, it becomes very clear that Chloe Benjamin chooses to explore prophecy in a way which highlights that prophecy can either become very powerful or very powerless, depending on how people react and behave in relation to them. I feel like it's very easy to know that at the beginning of the book, we can say that all four of the siblings were quite brave in their willingness to sort of face death head on. Next up we have Jamaica Inn by Daphne du Maurier, which I just think is such a brilliant book. It's definitely my favourite Daphne du Maurier book for many reasons, but one of those reasons is the mystery and courage which I feel like are central to this story. Now within this book we follow a young girl called Mary who has recently just lost her mum and for that reason she's going to go and live with her aunt, who's her mum's sister, and then her aunt's husband at their inn called Jamaica Inn. Now on her way down to go and live with them she finds out from certain people on the journey that Jamaica Inn is kind of considered to be a dark place and no respectable people really go there but Mary doesn't really have any choice because to be honest she has nowhere else to go so she goes along to this inn and as soon as she gets there she just starts to get a really weird vibe and doesn't necessarily trust her uncle at all and as she is there she starts to find out more and more things about some dark and mysterious things that might be happening at Jamaica Inn and all of her instincts are telling her to leave except for the fact that she doesn't feel like she can leave her aunt who seems like a vulnerable individual and feels like if she's leaving her aunt there then she's not doing her sort of duty as a good niece. And so for that reason, Mary has to really call on all of her internal courage, not only just to stay and protect her aunt and basically just be there as a support for her so that she knows that she's not alone in this dark place, but also to kind of go above and beyond that to try and figure out the mystery and uncover what her uncle is involved with and what dark things are occurring in Jamaica Inn. Now because her uncle kind of recognises Mary as a like troublesome character and someone who isn't just going to sit quietly like her aunt does, he basically puts a lot of restrictions on her and makes her life even more difficult. But through that we see Mary's courage and strength come out even more because she is so determined to sort of put right what she assumes is going wrong. And I feel like it's a really interesting book because as a reader, you really do follow along the story with Mary because she doesn't know anything going in and she doesn't know what it is that she may or may not uncover and neither do we as readers. So we just have to follow along blindly and sort of trust in her strength and courage to do the right thing and to figure out what's going on. So it's a book which really, really focuses on the need for courage and strength and bravery. And it's also really great just dark mystery in general so I absolutely love it but Mary is definitely a very Gryffindor character. So my final pick for Gryffindor recommendations would have to be Stephen King's Misery. Now this is a book which is thrilling, super intense, absolutely filled with action and is just generally such a page turner but I feel like one of the key things about this book which I think makes it great for a Gryffindor recommendation is the fact that the main character is super courageous right throughout. Now if you're not familiar with the story of Misery we basically follow our main character Paul who is a 
famous author and he's basically just finished a manuscript at the beginning of the book and is on his way back from a writing cabin in Colorado to New York but he's unfortunately caught in a car accident where he is rescued by a woman called Annie Wilkes who is a nurse and therefore keeps him in her home because she also happens to be Paul's number one fan. Now this is obviously a nightmare for Paul but right throughout the story when he is kept captive by this woman who claims to be his fan he basically is so focused on his goal of finding freedom. Now he has to pull on so many resources for this. He has to be super resourceful, cunning, intelligent, and careful about how he speaks to Annie because she's a very, very volatile character. However, his main focus is courage and his ability to maintain his focus on his goal of freedom. And I feel like his focus on his goal, his unwillingness to relent from trying to achieve it, and his bravery in constantly trying to trial different ways to achieve his goal just makes him so such a key Gryffindor character and I just feel like that makes Misery such a good recommendation for a Gryffindor type of book. So there we have it. Those are all of my book recommendations for the various Hogwarts houses. I hope you've enjoyed hearing my thoughts on the books I'd recommend for each of the houses and I'd love to hear whether you agree with me or whether you have different ideas about which books you'd recommend to each of the houses. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.